Sorry, I had to go get a copy to read from because I really want you guys to get this. Uh, Black Betty is the story of a dog who is raised by black people and then purchased by white people and given the power of speech. And the people who are uh, have purchased her are upset because she speaks African-American vernacular. They try a couple of times to get her to speak what they call good English. Say something, Betty, Lori urged her. Show Carolyn how smart you are. Carolyn sat on the floor, legs crossed and tucked to one side. What you want, I should say, asked Betty. Oh, for that's no better, Dad. Carolyn jumped up from her armchair to leave. The, the people you brought this place from sold us a freaking ghetto dog. Later, Betty encounters a cat who's also been treated this way and then they talk and the cat sounds like a cat. Betty asks, who you belong to? I'm a cat. I don't belong to anybody. Baby Boo licked his sleek belly. But is you black or white? So in that in that uh, section, I, I dropped words. Instead of who do you belong to, it's who you belong to. Um, I changed the word order. I was basically doing things with the grammar rather than with the spelling of these words to show this was a different speech pattern. Uh, you can also do this with word choice. Uh, again, look at your results from doing the exercise. I got in my car and drove to my apartment. That's a second option. A third option is to change the rhythm to match the rhythm of a non-standard speech pattern. You can change the rhythm internal to the word. You could say, uh, as my Jamaican instructor said, vegetables rather than vegetables. You can change the rhythm of the sentence or the passage. And to do this sort of thing, I recommend listening to recordings of speech patterns that you want to mimic, write them out, and write out your text underneath what you've written so that you can try and match the emphasis and the poetic meter and that sort of thing. That's a third option. A fourth option is to use cultural references to clue in your readers and provide the patterns you want to evoke in their own heads. Um, you can have your characters talk about hairdos, food, taboos. Um, a book that does a good job of this, I would say, is Midnight Robber by Nalo Hopkinson. And a fifth option, you can use punctuation and italicization, which in certain cases may not be strictly grammatical, but you can stick with your choices in the face of editorial argument and use that sort of emphasis to show a different style. Uh, Matt Ruff did this very successfully in his novel, Lovecraft Country. Uh, another exercise you can try Render an overheard conversation in a non-standard speech pattern phonetically. Then try using the alternative methods I've listed above. Get someone else to read both versions and ask them which made the most sense, which they would prefer to read. Again, those methods are word omission and word order changes word choice, rhythm, cultural references, punctuation, and italicization. Two more things that I want to say about rendering non-standard speech patterns. Uh, the first is something called code switching. Dialect is dependent on time and audience as well as on regional culture. 
So just as other speech patterns are dependent on time and audience, you want to make sure that you're reflecting this when you depict non-standard speech. Not only do these patterns change with time, as slang, for instance, evolves over decades, a character's use of them can change within a day or an hour or a minute even. I, um, it just depends on what, what's being done, what's trying to happen, what the speaker wants to accomplish. Um, as an example, uh, there is an author and editor named Cherie Renee Thomas who comes from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And she was talking about code switching one time and gave an example of three different ways of saying that she had gone to the store. She said, I could tell you I went to the store. I could say I went to the store. Or I could say win a store. That last one just sounds like one word to me, but if she wanted to convey to someone that they were in the same group, then she could use win a stow. If she wanted to exclude someone from knowing what she meant and she knew that they were not in the same group, the language group, then she would say win a stow either way. So remember to show how your characters talk differently throughout your story depending on context. And finally, watch out for the problem of translating a character's dialogue, which is spoken in their first language, into so-called pidgin or broken English. This is sad and lazy. People who are fluent in Japanese should be depicted as fluent when you're writing their Japanese dialogue, even if you're writing it in English. Translate the flow and music of their speech without rendering it primitive or making it a symbol of their subhuman status. Those are the things that I can share with you about writing dialect and writing dialogue and with the special uh, consideration that I as a writer of speculative fiction have learned to employ. Thank you.